The following presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. Good to see you all in the house of the Lord. This week we are taking a one-week break from our series in 1 Thessalonians because today is a special day in the church. Today is All Saints Day, a day when we celebrate the saints who have lived long ago, the saints of all the ages, and the saints of today because we are also saints who are following this way of Jesus. And so happy All Saints Sunday. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence here today. We thank you that as we've gathered together in your name, that you are here in our midst. And I pray, Lord, that as we look into your word on this All Saints Sunday, that you would speak to us, that you would change our lives, that you would help us to apply this word to our lives and to live as the disciples that you are calling us to be. May it be so, we ask in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So when you hear Jesus' Beatitudes, these blessed ours, that's what Beatitudes means. It means blessed. When you hear these Beatitudes, what do you think about? What do you think about? Well, whenever I hear them, I return to my Sunday school class in the basement of Kitzmiller Assembly of God Church. As a five-year-old, I remember Eula Sims reaching into her impressive collection of flannel graph people, right? How many of you remember flannel graph? And she would neatly arrange them on that green cloth background. She set out a little mountain, and on the mountain, she positioned a group of people and then right smack dab in the middle, she placed Jesus. Oh, and Jesus always had long wavy hair, right? He was always white with blue eyes and red cheeks and a smile. Well, then in a sweet, gentle tone, Eula would read the Beatitudes to us. And it felt like we had entered another world. Now as an adult, I hear these words, and after I finished reminiscing on the flannel graph of my childhood, it still seems that Jesus must be living in another world. I mean, seriously, in what world could people really follow Jesus' teaching? In what world could you really do what Jesus is saying here? These words are beautiful, but don't you think they're a little far-fetched? These words remind me of all the ways that I fail to live up to the calling of Christian discipleship. Because I'm not always meek, I'm not always merciful, I'm not always a peacemaker, and I don't really like persecution. Anyone here like persecution? So what are we to do with these famous words of Jesus here at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5? Well, first, first I'm inclined to just try harder, right? Just try harder. Maybe I'll take a stab at being meeker or purer or mercifuler. I just made that word up. It's a nice one, right? Maybe then, maybe then God will notice and God will reward me with the blessing that he talks about. But in the end, in the end, since these Beatitudes do not translate easily into our practical day-to-day -day lives, I'm tempted to just put them aside, to throw them away. Because Jesus' teaching presents an impossible ideal, an ideal that we can never hope to attain. So why bother? We're going to fail miserably. So why even try? But what if, what if the Beatitudes are not a set of impossible ideals to achieve? What if they're not a demanding moral code? What if instead Jesus is inviting us into a whole new world, just like Eula Sims used to invite me into a whole new world with her flannel graph board? What if he is inviting us into a whole new world that is characterized by grace? What if the Beatitudes point to a new reality, the reality of God's healing and reconciling love, reconciling love? What if this focus is on God's grace, the grace that we experience in Jesus Christ? You see, if we interpret the Beatitudes as a set of rules to live by, then we sever them from their roots in the tradition of Israel's prophets. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus quotes Isaiah more than any other prophet. 
And the Beatitudes reiterate Isaiah's description of God's reign, of God's government, of God's kingdom. Indeed, several of Jesus' statements seem to derive from Isaiah chapter 61. And that is the same passage that Jesus read in his inaugural sermon in Luke chapter 4 when he proclaimed these words, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In that sermon where Jesus taught in that scripture, was that passage about human efforts to live up to a high ideal? Is it urging us to become poor or to be imprisoned or to become blind or to become oppressed so that God will reward us? No. What that passage is, is a celebration. It's a celebration because God is acting graciously. God is acting graciously to deliver us from our poverty and our captivity and to bring us into God's reign of deliverance and joy. And it is the same way with the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes highlight God's gracious deliverance, and at the same time, they highlight our joyous participation in that deliverance. New Testament scholar Glenn Stason calls this participative grace. Say that pretty fast a couple times, right? Participative. He makes up this lovely word. It means that we participate in God's grace. And grace is defined as God's deliverance, God's transforming initiative, not our achievement, because grace always implies a gift, something that we don't deserve. But just because it's a gift, that doesn't mean that we do nothing. That doesn't mean that we just accept it, accept it as passive recipients. No, because God loved us, because God has delivered us, we are now enabled to live in a new way. And when God delivers us, and when Jesus becomes the center of our lives, then the Holy Spirit empowers us to participate in the work that God is doing in the world. He invites us to participate in the grace of God. From the beginning, Jesus' ministry drew crowds of people from many directions. At the beginning of chapter 5, Matthew indicates that Jesus, seeing these crowds, climbs a mountain in order to teach. And this section from Matthew chapter 5 through 7 is commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. We, we studied it back in January and February. It's Jesus' longest extended teaching about discipleship in the Gospels. And to give this teaching, Jesus ascends a mountain. This mountain points to another mountain. Throughout his Gospel, Matthew shows Jesus as the new Moses. At Moses' birth, Pharaoh gave orders to do away with every male Hebrew child. The birth of Jesus was accompanied by Herod's slaughter of the innocents. When Moses was a young man, he was forced to leave his homeland because Pharaoh sought his life. Similarly, Jesus was providentially taken from the land of his birth because Herod wanted to kill him. After the death of Pharaoh, Moses was commanded by God to return to Egypt. After the death of Herod, Joseph was commanded by an angel to return to Israel. Moses took his wife and his sons and returned to Egypt. Joseph took his wife and his son and went back to Israel. Moses led his people through the Exodus and interpreted the law to them. And now Jesus is bringing about a new Exodus and he is proclaiming a new law. Thus, this mountain signifies Mount Sinai. But note one important difference. One important difference. When he went up to the mountain, Moses received the law. But when Jesus went up on the mountain, he gives the instruction. He gives the law. Jesus is even greater than Moses. Thus, Matthew pictures Jesus as an authoritative teacher, the new Moses atop a new Mount Sinai, teaching the new instructions of this kingdom of God. And we are invited to listen in and to let these words pour over us, to let that grace pour over us. Each beatitude begins with joy. It begins with the joy, the happiness, the blessedness of the good news of our participation in God's gracious deliverance. And then each beatitude ends by pointing to the reality of God's coming reign. But the way of life that leads to blessing in God's kingdom ran radically counter to the prevailing ethos of that time. And it runs radically, it runs radically counter to the prevailing ethos of our own time. In the world's eyes, God blesses the proud, God blesses the powerful. God blesses the rich, the champions, the strong, 
the winners, you know, the people are in front of the Wheaties box, right? Along comes Jesus. Along comes Jesus, and his words form a direct challenge to the assumptions of the world. The world tells us to be rich so we can get whatever we want. The world tells us to seek power so that we can take what we want. The world tells us to argue so that we can have our way. After all, we got to look out for number one, right? Because if we don't look out for number one, no one's going to do it for too long. For too long, that has been the myth with which we have lived. And Jesus' life and teachings fly in the face of that myth. Jesus offers us a fundamentally different way, and it is a way that is contrary to the ways of the world. It is a way that is contrary to the spirit of this age. The spirit of the age blesses the cocky and the self-confident. Jesus blesses the poor in spirit, those not brimming with self-confidence, but weighed down with self-doubt. The spirit of the age blesses those who are shallow and thus happy all the time, right? You know those people. But Jesus blesses those who have the capacity to mourn deeply. Jesus blesses those who lament because not all is right with the world. And so our hearts are broken. The spirit of the age blesses the power hungry who want to run the world. Jesus blesses the meek who are willing to trust God and to trust in his future. The spirit of the age blesses the privileged protectors of the status quo, but Jesus blesses the justice seekers. The spirit of the age blesses those who think justice is retribution and revenge, but Jesus blesses the merciful. The spirit of the age blesses the clever ones who come up with the best scheme, but Jesus blesses the pure-hearted who have no schemes. The spirit of the age blesses those who are great at waging wars, but Jesus blesses those who have the patience to work for peace. The spirit of the age blesses those who fight for might, but Jesus blesses those who suffer for what is right. You see, the Beatitudes, brothers and sisters, are pronouncements of grace. They are declarations of blessedness, and they are, are this, this word of blessedness on those whom the world doesn't seem to have much time for. The world doesn't have much time for people in pain, people who work for peace instead of profit, people who exercise mercy instead of vengeance. Those who live in this way, the world considers them losers. They are viewed as weak and unsuccessful. But those people whom the world sees as weak and unsuccessful are the ones who have God's favor. In today's world, that sounds a lot like weakness and foolishness. But in the new world that Jesus proclaims, it is the power of God and it is the grace of God. Oh, these Beatitudes, they provide a window. They provide us a window into the very life of Jesus Christ. They reveal to us Jesus' personality. If we ask the question, if we ask this question, what is Jesus like? What is Jesus like? The best answer that we can offer is this. Jesus is like the Beatitudes. Jesus is like the Beatitudes. Jesus is drawn to the poor and the sorrowful. Jesus stands up for the meek and the persecuted. Jesus exhibits justice and mercy. Jesus endur endorses purity and peacemaking. Look at the Beatitudes. This is what Jesus is like. And the fullest expression of a Beatitudinal life. I just made that up. Beatitudinal life. The fullest expression of that is seen in Jesus' crucifixion. The blessed life, the fullest expression, is seen in Jesus' crucifixion. You see, the moment that Jesus proclaimed the Beatitudes on that Galilean hillside, and he began to live them out, he was on a course that would lead to the hill of Calvary. And we find the Beatitudes, these Beatitudes on full display at Calvary, as Jesus dies upon the cross, forgiving his enemies while priests mock and women weep and a thief repents and a soldier makes a confession. We see all eight blessings of the Beatitudes played out in dramatic form. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Who is promised heaven at Calvary? It's not the spiritually rich Pharisees or the chief priests, but it is the spiritually bankrupt thief, the one who is crucified next to Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Who are the mourners at Calvary? It was the faithful women who had followed Jesus from Galilee. And who are the first to receive the comfort of Easter Sunday? It is those very same women. 
Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Five days earlier, Jesus had entered Jerusalem on a, a donkey in a very meek way. He made this claim to be king, and for that, Jesus was crucified. But who has received the nations as his inheritance, and whose kingdom now reaches from sea to sea? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. What is Jesus doing as he hangs upon the cross and cries out, I thirst? He is setting the world right. He is bringing righteousness to the world. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. It was the thief who expressed mercy to Jesus as he was being mocked who receives mercy and the promise of paradise. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It was the pagan soldier who made no claims of spiritual insight who saw in Jesus what the chief priest could not see. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Jesus had refused to take up the sword. Jesus refused to call upon armies of avenging angels to continue the cycle of violence. Instead, he made peace by the blood of the cross, and in his death, the Roman centurion made the pronouncement, truly, this was the Son of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was persecuted for righteousness' sake by the principalities and the powers, but it is at the cross that God begins to remake the world. God begins to remake the world according to righteousness, and it is at the cross that the reign of the kingdom of heaven begins. My friends, the Beatitudes and the cross ultimately point to the same thing. What the Beatitudes proclaim, the cross demonstrates. And it is this that we are called to emulate as followers of Jesus Christ. It is this that we are called to emulate. The beauty of co-suffering love as defined by the Beatitudes and as demonstrated by the cross. The Beatitudes represent a grace-filled invitation to follow Jesus. A grace-filled invitation to follow Jesus from one hillside to another. From Galilee to Calvary. And as we follow Jesus in response to his love, as we walk in his way, these beatitudes will become manifest in our own lives. It's not about trying harder. You know, we don't seek out grief, but we're comforted when we do more. We don't pursue persecution, but we're not surprised or shaken when it comes. It's not that we must work hard at being humbler and meeker to get into the kingdom, but it's that as we yield to the Spirit, God will work within us by His grace to make us humble and meek. As we follow Jesus, we are a promise to experience not only the love, the forgiveness, the freedom, and the healing that comes in this life, but also a future full of every blessing in the life to come. And the Beatitudes announce, the Beatitudes announce that the world and its evaluation of who wins and who loses will not have the final say because in Jesus, God has the last word. That's what Easter is all about. Easter represents God's vindication of Jesus, and it represents God's vindication of the way of life that Jesus taught. Easter is many things, but among them, Easter is God's endorsement of the Beatitudes because Jesus lived out the Beatitudes to the point of death, and God vindicated their veracity by raising Jesus from the dead. According to Pastor David Lose, part of what we do when we celebrate All Saints Sunday involves participating in this new world. This new world that was brought about by the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we proclaim that God's kingdom is not something in the distance, but it, it, that it is something that transforms our reality even now. All Saints is a rehearsal of the Easter promise that there is something more, that there is something that transcends our immediate experience, and this proclamation finds its assurance in the truth that God's love and God's life are more powerful and more enduring than all of the hate and all of the disappointment and all of the death that the world could throw at us. That's why we can commend our loved ones into God's care with confidence because we know that He is a God who loves and that He is a God who takes care of His own. In Jesus' Beatitudes, we have received a new set of eyes. We receive a new vision. 
we receive a new vision capable of seeing a new world. It's a world in which no matter our circumstances or our situation, even if the world doesn't see us this way, even if we don't see ourselves this way, in this world, we are blessed and beloved by God. We are blessed and beloved by God, and it is pure grace. It is pure gift, and it is that. The fact that we are blessed and that we are beloved by God, it is that that connects us to all of the saints who have become, gone before us. And that's good news, that we are connected with that great cloud of witnesses because the hope that they had is the same hope that is ours. They were blessed and beloved, and so are we. And we don't even need a flannel graph Jesus to see this beautiful new world. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the teaching that Jesus gives us here of the Beatitudes. We confess, Jesus, that often we read this teaching and we just kind of dismiss it. It's just ideals that we can never live up to. But Lord, you call us blessed. And you pour your grace into our lives. And because you pour that grace into our lives, you then enable us by the power of your Holy Spirit to live as new people so that we can actually begin embodying the things that you highlight so that we can be merciful people, so that we can be peacemakers, so that we can be humble and poor in spirit. We thank you, God, for that good news of grace. We thank you that we are the beloved children of God and that we are blessed. And Lord, we, that you would help us, I pray this day, to respond to that blessing and to allow ourselves to yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we might become the disciples that you want us to be. We thank you, God, that you've called us to take this journey to follow you from the Mount of Beatitudes to the Mount Calvary. And Lord, that as we take this, that Mount Calvary is not the end of the story, but it goes from the Mount of Beatitudes to Calvary and finally to resurrection. And that is the hope that we proclaim and share today on this All Saints Sunday. And we give you thanks for that good news of grace. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.